So what if I told you that Fallout 3's main story ending back in 2008 is the reason that Starfield is the way it is today? The procedurally generated worlds, the copy-paste radiant quests that never end, the concept of having thousands of planets to visit, all of this was due to feedback that fans gave at the end of Fallout 3's ending. Do I sound crazy? Well, I guess I am, but that's not the point. In a recent interview, Emil Pagliarulo was talking his usual game and provided a quote that was quite surprising to hear. Now, in case you didn't play Fallout 3 or its main story, here's a quick summary. At launch, anyone who got to the end of the game was presented with a choice. Either you or a NPC had to go into a heavily irradiated chamber and activate a water purifier. Whoever did so would die. So, if you sent Sarah in there, the ending slides pretty much called you a coward. Thus, many players were killed off. But either way, by completing the main quest in this game, players were met with ending credits. In order to go back and play, you'd have to reload a save prior to this point. Fans explained that they were dissatisfied with this setup, and as a result, the game was changed. After purchasing one of the five available DLCs for Fallout 3, after completing the main quest, you would now pass out, wake up, and you'd have survived the reactor, and thus your adventure could continue. It was, in my opinion, the right move. But in an article from The Gamer, on this subject, Emil had this to say. Let me tell you, players did not like that. And that was really the moment we realised that our fans don't want to play our games. They want to live in the worlds we create. That means their experiences never end. And the content, whatever it is, works together as seamlessly as we can make it. So, fans don't want to play games. I mean, it makes sense. There's nothing worse than when I buy a game and it arrives and then my wife says, are you going to play it? Play it? That's so 2000s. We shall read the case, look at the disc, and then put it away. It's common sense, eh? But Emil also says people want to live in our games. As in, they want to be in there forever. Never leave. And although this may look like a harmless comment, to me, it says a lot more than you think. So in this video, I'm going to explain why fans complained about the Fallout 3 ending, really, what Emil has said, and how it's been reflected in Bethesda's recent work. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Quick side note, if you love gaming and you love videos on gaming, please consider subscribing. Okay, back to the video. Now, let's discuss the ending of Fallout 3. So, the general, very summarised plotline of Fallout 3 is that the player, the Lone Wanderer, leaves the vault to go and find his father, who also left. His father, James, had a goal of making a water purifier to help the wasteland. After working with James and Dr. Lee, the player heads to the memorial to help get the machine working again. It goes bad and Colonel Autumn of the Enclave deploys a force to the memorial. The Enclave wants to inject the purifier with a deadly virus that will kill any mutated organisms who drink the water, including humans. They confront our father at the memorial where the purifier is located. Our father sacrifices himself for some reason. He floods the entire purifier full of radiation, taking Colonel Autumn with him. Turns out the Colonel survives, and he captures us later on, and then the President of the Enclave sets us free to enact his plan, which was of no benefit to anyone, ourselves least of all. With the help of the Brotherhood of Steel, we break into the Memorial and get to a standoff point with the Enclave. Finally, Colonel Autumn gives his life up to stop us from turning on the machine that he was trying to turn on. At the end, the Enclave defeated themselves by sabotaging the machine they were trying to activate, causing it to explode even though it shouldn't have, and it obliged us to enter the purifier and die to radiation. So, that's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek summary of the plot, but it ended up with you having to sacrifice yourself at the end. One of the complaints a lot of people had is that the ending felt forced, like the writer, looking at you Emil, just wanted to force a hero sacrifice onto the plot, regardless of it making sense or not, which it did not. Now, you can pick up companions in this game. One of them can sacrifice herself, but then the narrator would essentially call you a coward in the end credits, and we ain't no cowards. But we had a super mutant companion with us who are essentially unaffected by radiation. 
So let's send them. Win-win. It's fully safe. But nope. When you asked your super mutant follower Forks if they would go into the reactor to switch it off, since it's completely safe for them, they would say, no, it's your destiny to go and die to radiation. So it really felt like logic was out of the window and they just wanted you to die. The whole main story was a bit of a mess and people generally were upset with this whole lack of logic and being forced to go in, die, in order to see the main story come to a conclusion. It wasn't very satisfying. So that was one reason why people complained. Again, writing. But the second thing is, Fallout 3 is a big game. The base game had 58 main and side quests. It has 163 marked locations, a lot of which you can go inside of. Basically, there's a lot to do. And despite the dodgy writing in the main story, a lot of the side stuff was actually very good. The main quest was 22 hours in length, but the whole game, if you explored it, would get you over 100 hours worth of gameplay. So, essentially, people didn't want the game to just end. They wanted the ability to keep playing after completing the main story, as they had in most open world games, including Bethesda titles. Most people who play open world video games will knock the main story out first, then do the side quests and then sort of explore afterwards. Morrowind, Oblivion, you could finish the main story and then carry on and go do everything else you want to afterwards. You didn't have to sacrifice yourself. It also meant DLC could be added afterwards and players could jump straight into it. So this was, to my knowledge, the first time Bethesda had forced ending credits onto the player. So it came as a shock. But on the whole, the main reasons for people voicing concerns about this was A, the whole plot didn't really need to end in the player sacrificing themselves, and B, they wanted to be able to continue playing the game after the main story, as they had in previous Bethesda games. So Emil heard the fans. He finally listened and said, That was really the moment we realised that our fans don't want to play our games. They want to live in the world we create. That means their experiences never end and the content, whatever it is, works together as seamlessly as we can make it. So I personally think he has completely misunderstood what people meant. But regardless of what the fans actually meant with their feedback, Emil listened and all he heard was, they want to live in these worlds, they want them to never end. So how did this impact Bethesda games after Fallout 3? So Skyrim comes out, massive open world, lots of quests, but they added something new. The Radiant Side Quest. This is a quest that never ends and has essentially no writing involved. An example of this is a bounty from a bartender. You can go in and you ask, is there a bounty? They'll reply with a generic, the guard left this bounty here, and then you'll get a note. On it, the AI will generate an enemy and a location. So go kill the giant at the West Camp. You come back, you get your reward, and then you get another bounty. Never ending content. But Skyrim was so big and had so much to offer that it didn't really matter. It was a very small part of the overall package and nobody really minded the addition of them. Now, let's talk about Fallout 4. In this game, the Radiant quests were added and a lot of them too. For example, when you first meet the Brotherhood of Steel, you have to learn how to access Radiant quests by doing favours for the Brotherhood of Steel. One of them is like the bounty system from Skyrim, go clear X location of X enemies, come back and then go do another one. The other was go get X item in X location. Then we had another settlement has sent word that they need our help, where Preston would constantly tell the players to go and help another settlement. This other settlement would then give another Radiant quest, like kill X person over there, or go get X from here, and it was non-stop. Then settlements got attacked and they needed defending. Now each faction had tons of these Radiant quests, and this is when I stopped enjoying Bethesda games as much. If they want to add Radiant quests that never end, that's fine. Nobody complains about additional content for free, but it was the fact that the Radiant quests had now taken over the place of a lot of handwritten story quests from the previous entries. There are no characters, no story, no plot. It's literally a fetch quest and busy work. It's nice to have as an option, but pretty soon your quest log is full of these things. So the ratio was growing in favour of Radiant never ending side quests in Bethesda's recent title Fallout 4. Now we get to Starfield, and oh boy, it's all Radiant. 
over 1,000 planets, all procedurally generated. You can always go and explore, as there's always more planets. Radiant quests galore. They actually added terminals with exploration radiant quests where you could go and scan a planet for hours. For, for no reason. Bounties, scanning, it never ended. So now the ratio has gone almost 100% to these radiant quests. The map never ends, the quests never end, the writing is less. Bethesda went from a game like Fallout 3 that had 18 well-written side quests with detailed characters, decision making, role playing elements, character development, to having hundreds of never ending quests that had no stories, got really repetitive and offered nothing unique. This is one of the reasons Starfield failed. Now, I've done a video which explains more, but in a nutshell, maps on Starfield are randomly generated. Dungeons are placed randomly and drawn from a bank of pre-made designs. Quests never end and neither do the planets. So in their attempt to make their games never ending, they made it incredibly dull and tedious. Before, you could clear the map in Skyrim and see everything. In Starfield, you can't. In my opinion, I prefer quality over quantity. I'd rather have 20 well written unique side quests rather than a thousand radiant side quests with no plotline. Like I said, radiant quests can be an option, it's not a bad thing, they had a few in Skyrim, but when it becomes the main game, it's a not so fun experience. So just to go over Emil's quote once more, that was really the moment we realised that our fans don't want to play our games, they want to live in the worlds we create. That means their experiences never end and the content, whatever it is, works together as seamlessly as we can make it. He took the negative response to the forced ending in Fallout 3 to mean that players wanted to live in their games. What that meant is he thought we want the world to never end, the quest to never end, the content to never end. I want to live here in Starfield forever. Now, some people may want this, but I honestly doubt many of Bethesda fans really do. Despite Emil declaring we don't want to play their games, I generally think people do want to play them. But mostly, I think people want to play a fun game. That's it. The fact that people still love Morrowind, Oblivion and Skyrim, but they tend to dislike Fallout 4 and Starfield, shows that people much prefer the quality of handwritten quests and activities over the never ending radiant stuff. Now New Vegas came out in 2010. That game had unbelievable writing and each quest required role playing, stats, characters, plot twists and it involved decision making which directly impacted the game. It had over 102 of those side quests. That game was made by Obsidian using Bethesda's Fallout 3 engine and assets. So somehow Obsidian managed both quality and quantity. But to this day, Bethesda have either given one or the other. Maybe they can't do both, but I would much rather they go back to the original setup of handwritten stories, well-designed maps, and hand-placed dungeons. I don't want to live in the world. I just want to enjoy my time in it, whether that's 10 hours or 100 hours. But anyway, I've done other videos about how Bethesda needs to improve and what they need to do to get their games on track. But this is about Emil. I recently did a video about how Emil's writing is hurting Bethesda, but one thing I touched on is how he doesn't understand his own fans. This again shows how he still doesn't. The feedback from Fallout 3's ending was not a cry out for games that never end. Nobody said, aw, I can't believe I have to die in the game, I just want to live forever in Fallout 3, I just want it to never end, not even for 20 years. They had other reasons, but as this is the standard, Emil completely misunderstood what the fans were saying and took it another way. The outcome now is Starfield. Honestly, at this point, I don't know if it's for this reason alone or trying to reach a different audience why they've changed their model to these never-ending quests, never-ending worlds, adding building mechanics among never-ending content, trying to be like Minecraft or games like that, but if they are trying to do that, it will end in tears. With the games made this way with the new model, Bethesda are rapidly losing the fanbase who love their games that I've mentioned. But at the same time, they are making games that other crowds aren't interested in, because Bethesda games can't do what those other games can do as well. 
Now, they're not making great RPG games or great crafting exploration games, they're just making poorer versions of both, and if they're not careful, they could lose all their fans altogether. But the main thing is, Fallout 3 drops, fans complain about the game's ending, Emil takes that as a plea for never-ending content, which means we see more Radiant content added with each subsequent release, and as the repetitive content increased with each release, the scores do the opposite and continue to decrease. But anyway, that's it for this one, but let me know your thoughts. Do you agree with me, or do you think I've misunderstood what Emil is saying? Am I reaching a little bit? Did you like the story in Fallout 3? And do you have any hope left for Bethesda at this point? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, and if you're new here, please consider subscribing. I'm Av Gaming, where I do video game analysis, identifying what makes great games great, and what could make good games great as well. Thanks for watching, Av out.